Querem que eu fale em português ou em inglês? <laughs> inglês, yeah. Well, in fact, uh, I prepared my whole slide presentation in Portuguese, and then Esper said, Lúcio, dá para você falar em inglês? Aí eu tive que mudar tudo de novo para o inglês. Então vai ser em inglês, mas eu vou falar bem devagar, so that the foreigners can understand me with my Brazilian Mineiro accent. First of all, I'd like to thank Esper and the organization of this wonderful uh, meeting. In fact, I would love to like, give a salva de palmas to Esper, because without him, this would not really come out. It's a wonderful opportunity, not just for you guys to learn from like, top-notch people you know, around the world and in the research of HIV and SIV and other infectious diseases, but also for us, because he puts us together and we start talking, we spend like one week discussing and having even like a personal relationship, which is wonderful for bonding. Okay, thank you so much, Esper. And I am um, brown nosing, estou puxando o saco do Esper, because Esper was born in my hometown, which is Itajubá in Minas Gerais. In fact, Itajubá exports pão de queijo, cachaça, and scientists. We have a third one here, o Tiago ali. Tiago is also my cousin and from Itajubá. So, I mean, we are conquering the world. Uh, we have wonderful scientists there now. But anyway, I know Esper since I was four years old. He was a very good friend of mine, and for the past three years we've been working together. Um, I've been 17 years already in uh, Hopkins in Baltimore. So, sorry, is that the, my screen is screwed up. I have no idea what's happening until like, I see it over there in the other screen. Um, I came here to talk to you about a work that we did together. And, uh, understanding how monocytes are important during the infection for SIV and HIV. In fact, uh, we're going to present you some data that we just finished last year and we published. And, and when I was preparing this presentation, I kept thinking, it's going to be a good idea to just talk about it or add a little bit more of information of other things that I read preparing for this talk and preparing for my thesis which were very, very interesting. I think it's going to be very interesting for you guys as well. So in fact, it's not just new perspectives of the, on the role of monocytes, but also other myeloid cells in the infection of HIV and SIV. And as I said, I belong to this group called the Retrovirus Lab in uh, Johns Hopkins University. And I would love to stress in this moment the word Johns Hopkins. It's not John Hopkins. And I know that it's obnoxious to say that, but it's so, so many people say the word wrong that last year they decided to have like an April 1st, um primeiro de abril, and pretend that it was so tiring of people saying the word wrong that they re decided to remove the S from Johns Hopkins, so that now people say John Hopkins, but it is not. The name of the guy who found it, who gave the money for the university is Johns, so it's Johns Hopkins. But anyway, so as I said, I've been working with this group for 17 years, no, for 10 years, I Hopkins for 17, but with this group for, uh, for 10 years. And this group is, co is coordinated by two very important people there, Hopkins and in the uh, scientific community, is Janice Clements and C. Zink, or Christina Zink. And uh, Christine Zink, she's a pathologist, veterinarian, and Janice is a molecular biologist. Uh, a long time ago, they got together and they decided to found this, um, this group uh, is studying uh, a model for multiple sclerosis using sheep and visna. And after that, uh, Bill O'Ryan, which was like the, their boss, uh, moved from Hopkins and they decided to start working with SIV and they developed a very uh, consistent uh, uh, model for uh, HIV and SIV. And in case people keep asking me where Baltimore is, I put a map here, here Brazil, here you have the United States, and here is Baltimore. Uh, it's squeezed between Washington and uh, Philadelphia. It's a beautiful town. I mean, a little bit not safe, but uh, it's very nice. And uh, every time now that I come here and say that I'm from Baltimore, there's always someone that says, oh, I watched Hairspray. And then they start singing, Bom dia, Baltimore, because it was passed in Baltimore. So if you haven't seen this musical yet, go and watch it, because it's all about Baltimore and the rats in the street and you know the perverts that walk around. Anyway. Uh, so as I said, we developed a very nice model for uh, neurocognitive disorders in SIV. And although it's something that had been happening for a long time, even after treatment with antiretrovirus, uh, I was very surprised that the media was not taking a lot of attention you know, about like, what's happening after uh, the heart era. 
And I don't know if you guys remember this, you know, in 1988 for the foreigners, this guy was one of the most important poets and lyricists in our generation, and he died of AIDS in 1989. Uh, this, uh, he was one of the first uh, big guys here in Brazil like, to confess that he had AIDS, and his face was in the front page of the most important magazine, which is Veja, so Cazuza. And I was very surprised when I was walking the train station in New York um, in 2009. And not in the cover, but inside the magazine, we have another kind of AIDS crisis. What is happening now is that uh, AIDS patients, they are being treated with heart, with antiretroviral therapy, but they still keep developing a lot of neurocognitive disorders. They don't have like dementia as it was in the past, but they still get older much faster than a person that is not infected with HIV. And not just older in terms of brain, but in terms of uh, heart, in terms of osteosporosis. And uh, it's, going to be, it's very interesting because Alan, Alan is going to talk about aging uh, after, you know, uh, I think like the third talk after me. And he's going to talk about, specifically about age, my cells in aging and HIV. Okay. Um, as I said, we have like a very important model, which is very consistent, very reproducible. We infect monkeys, and in less than 90 days, 90% 90 of those monkeys develop encephalitis. Even like a very severe encephalitis, the monkeys get very sick very fast, or they can have like a very mild encephalitis. But you still can uh, diagnose this encephalitis by pathological evidence in the brain. Um, this model kind of mimics what happens in the AIDS, uh, in human AIDS, although it's very short. We almost don't have like the symptomatic uh, um, time. And we don't use rhesus monkeys. As you can see, like, you know, the O'Connor's talking about synomalgos and also rhesus monkeys. We use the pig-tailed monkeys. It's Macaca nemestrina. Uh, I'm not going to tell this story about how we came to the, uh, we use pig-tailed macaques, but they are very susceptible to this combination of virus that we use. It's not just one clone. You have, like, two clones. It's a dual inoculation. We use a very neuropathogenic clone called uh, SIV-17EFR, or FRED, in Spanish, FRED. And uh, uh, SIV Delta B670, which is a swarm of uh, immunosuppressive strains. And the very interesting thing is that if you just infect the monkeys with this or this, they take a long time to develop encephalitis. Once you put them together in 90 days, at times 45 days, they start developing encephalitis and other uh, neurocognitive uh, symptoms. Um, all of them develop AIDS. All of them have a, a very strong depletion of CD4s. So as here the picture of the pigtailed macaques, which uh, it's very interesting that the rhesus macaques they are very aggressive. They we put the two of them together and they like they beat each other, especially if they are males. Pigtails they are very peaceful, but according to my veterinarian there at Hopkins, they say that they be kind of like play mind games, or they keep looking at each other like. I'm going to screw you, I'm going to screw you. And it's very stressful even for, for those monkeys to be you know, in, in that situation. But uh, we normally we have, like, we have a farm in, um, close to Baltimore, and we bring those animals and inoculate those animals in our laboratory, which is in our building. So we take care of our monkeys, we sacrifice our monkeys, we treat our monkeys. Uh, our group the, is being publishing uh, in an SIV uh, model, this SIV model, since 1997. So we have already like, published a lot of things related to, like, for instance, latency of HIV in the brain and the importance of interferon for the latency of HIV in the brain. We published some time ago about the coordination of immune responses in the brain and how, uh, how, synchronous, uh, how synchronous it is, this uh, response. And now we see the same kind of response in other organs, which is very interesting. Um, we, let's see which one is this, okay, so, and we also developed a, a model for uh, treatment for heart. It's a very aggressive model for SIV disease, but we're able to, uh, by the use of four drugs, to really control the replication of the virus and put those animals in like uh, less than 50 copies per, uh, per ml of SIV per ml. So now we have a model as well of heart. And here's one of the last uh, papers that we published showing that it's very similar to what happens in humans. So it's not just a model for uh, neuro AIDS, but we also can use that for other diseases, including heart, heart the coração, like the organ, not heart the therapy. But even the heart, uh, the, the organ, you know, the cardiopathy or the neuropathy, everything is related to one cell in our case, which is the macrophage. The macrophage is the most important cell for the infection in the brain. 
um, not just macrophages, but microglia, which are kind of you know similar to macrophages. They are the main source of replication of the virus in the brain. Uh, astrocytes also can get infected, but not as strongly as in macroglia and, and macrophages. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about macrophages and then what happened after that and why I decided to study monocytes. So macrophages, they, as you might know, although I'm going to challenge you guys a little bit uh, in the end, but macrophages are originated from monocytes or even like some progenitor cells that stay in the tissues during development. Uh, we know that some macrophages can self-replicate. Uh, Langerha cells, which are some people say they are macrophages, some people say they are dendritic cells, but they can, they can multiply in the, in the skin. But most of them are originated from blood monocytes. They have diverse phenotypes. I mean, there's just one kind of macrophage. People keep asking me about like M1 or M2, but you have other kinds of macrophages. If you just go to one organ, you can find four or five kinds of macrophages, for instance, in the spleen. Um, they are susceptible to HIV and SIV infection. We have seen that. We can do that in vitro. We see that in vivo. Uh, they are very long-lived cells because they stay in the tissue for long periods of time. They can be a very nice reservoir for the replication, or for even like for viruses that are not replicating very intensely. And uh, a very interesting thing that was published one year, two years ago, is that they do not release the virus uh, as clearly as uh, T cells do. What happens is because they look like big amoebas. What Someone published a very beautiful paper showing that most of the virions that are released from macrophages, in fact, they get trapped within the membrane outside of the cell. And it's very interesting because those traps, they prevent the action of antibodies of even other cells to, to detect those viruses. So it's one more um, feature of those cells that is very different from T cells, for instance. Um, monocytes. We know about monocytes for a long period of time, since people start like, you know, early, in the beginning of like, not beginning, the end of like two centuries ago, we knew that we have mononuclear phagocytes in the blood. But it took a, some time to understand that the macrophages and monocytes were in fact the same cell. And we have a lot of papers, I, I went like to the archives at Hopkins to find those papers when they still like draw instead of taking pictures, you know, like what is a macrophage, what is a monocyte. But even at that time, they also knew that monocytes were not a homogeneous population in the blood. Florence Sabin, who worked at Hopkins, she wrote a beautiful paper uh, calling them not monocytes, but they were like mononuclear phagocytes of Ehrlich or things like that. And uh, it took me some time to find out when the monocyte word was coined. I, in fact, I couldn't really find out the paper. It was a paper in Germany that coined the word monocyte. But monocytes, they, they are like the precursors for macrophages, but it took some time for people to really see that. As I said, they are mononuclear leukocytes in the blood. They are the precursors for, for uh, phagocytes in tissues, for macrophages, dendritic cells, osteoclasts, microglia. They are of myeloid origin. In fact, they, they come from monoblasts direct from the bone marrow. They don't have to pass in, uh, uh, through another organ to get mature. And they are very short-lived. In fact, during inflammation, monocytes can disappear from the blood very fast, and they go to the tissue very fast in terms of or, or, uh, hours. But they can stay until like five days. Um, and because of that, a lot of times I heard they being called as intermediate cells, as if they are cells that are there just to make macrophages. And now this uh, idea is changing. They have like their own importance, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about here. Um, they are antigen-presenting cells, and they express, they typically express CD14, which was the first pattern recognition receptor. You know, CD14 recognized LPS, the, the wall of bacteria, besides TLR4. Uh, and they also uh, uh, present all the myeloid markers like CD11B or CD33. Um, as I told you guys a long time ago, people already knew that we had like, two, at least two populations of monocytes in the blood according to their morphology. And uh, with the advent of flow cytometry, we were able to separate those two populations. And, uh, okay, that's and uh, by Staining those cells with CD14 and CD16, you can see that uh, the large uh, population here of monocytes are negative or very low for CD16, but very high for CD14. We call those cells the classical monocytes because they have like, the, C the high CD14. Um, but they already found out that this population here is also a population of monocytes, and uh, they received the name the non-classical. 
in the past like five years, they changed those names. It used to be like inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, but now I think that the nomenclature is that classical and non-classical. But you can see that it's almost as if those cells are coming from this population and becoming this population here. And that's true. Uh, this population here in the middle, which is 16 high, 14 high, they are also a very, um, they are not a homogeneous, they're very heterogeneous, but there is a paper that was published last year uh, proving that this population is phenotypically and functionally distinct from the classicals and from the non-classicals. And now we call this population intermediate monocytes. Uh, monocytes are very important in HIV and HIV um, field. Uh, although it's very controversial whether the cell can, um, can host like the replication of this virus. We know that it can be infected, but they still have a lot of discussion if the virus can replicate inside monocytes or not. We know the macrophages can hold the replication, but we don't know if uh, monocytes are, at least like clearly. So uh, as I said, uh, first of all, monocytes express it for and CCR5 which are the main receptor for virus replication, for HIV replication. Not as, in, as uh, abundantly as CD4s, uh, as T cells, uh, CD T cells, but um, nonetheless, they have CD4s that they have CCR5. They are infectable. In fact, we can infect uh, monocytes, and if you select monocytes from the blood of patients, even patients that are being treated with heart, we can find the virus integrating the genome of those cells. But we don't know if there is replication, active replication. In fact, they have like several uh, trans uh, restriction factors that prevent the replication of the virus. And those uh, uh, restriction factors at times are different from the restriction factors from macrophages. Um, and the other problem that we have here, it's a caveat here, is that a lot of those studies were done by bead selection, putting the monocytes and trying to understand if they have RNA of the SIV, or, which means that there is active replication. But uh, at times it can be, those preps can be contaminated by T cells, and now we have methods to prove that that is contamination or not. Um, but independently of the replication, we have to think of the monocytes as a very nice uh, Trojan horse, in Cavallo de Troia. You know, the, it can carry the virus to other tissues, and once they become macrophages, in that point, they're gonna become very rep, rep, uh, replicative, and then we're gonna have the, uh, the release of viral particles. So just a uh, uh, recap of what monocytes, how monocytes uh, are, or evolve uh, from the bone marrow, and here's important because the population that I found is gonna be related to this little scheme here, so please pay attention. So monocytes, as I said, they come from the bone marrow, okay? They come from monoblasts, and one of the most important markers for the monoblasts is the combination of CD4 positive, CD14 positive. They do not have the CD33 marker, which is the myeloid marker, but they have CD34, which is the progenitor cells. With time, those cells, they lose CD34, but they gain CD33. That's very easy to see. We can see that every time that we work with bone marrows from our monkeys. And they gain a lot of amount of CCR2, which is a, a chemokine receptor, very important for the traffic of those cells from the bone marrow to blood and from blood to tissues. I mean, it's proved already in the mouse model that without CCR2, those cells get trapped inside the bone marrow, or at times they don't even move from part of the bone marrow to another part of the bone marrow. It's really important for the traffic of these cells. Once they are mature, and because of the gradient of, bone, of CCL2 in the blood and the bone marrow, those cells are released to the blood, and they are CD14 positive, high, CD16 negative, 16 negative, and CCR2 positive, which is a hallmark for classical monocytes. Hallmark for classical monocytes. So they are the classical monocytes, and think about that about them as the Americans when they went to Europe to fight the Nazis and they arrived in, Norm in Nor Normandy. As soon as they got there, there is a battle happening. They have to go straight to the fight. And that's what classical monocytes are. They are attracted to inflamed tissues, to infected tissues, and they traffic very fast to those tissues and they become macrophages, inflammatory macrophages. If you don't have inflammation, if you don't have infection, or if the monocytes don't pass through sites of inflammation, they evolve 
to non-classical monocytes. They become intermediate first, and then they become non-classical monocytes. And those non-classical monocytes, they have uh, low expression of CD14, high expression of CD16, and no expression of CCR2. So they lose the marker for the activation, not activation, for the trafficking to inflame the tissue. They gain other um, receptors, but the main one, at least in the mouse model, is the CX3CR1, which is the receptor for fractal kind of CX3CL1. And then they migrate to health tissues, and they become the resident macrophages, the resident monocytes, uh, out of the resident monocytes. So, 14 high, 16 negative, CCR2 positive, and then they become CCR2 negative. What happened was, uh, while I was studying the monocytes in my model, in our model, the SIV model, what I noticed it was that in the beginning of the infection, right at the beginning of the infection, there was a huge change in the expression of the CCR2 from CCR2 high to CCR2 negative or low in the classical monocytes and only in the classical monocytes. The intermediate monocytes, which also can have CCR2, had no change in the expression of CCR2. But the classical monocytes lost a lot of CCR2, and this loss of CCR2 expression, it's very intense at seven days, change a little bit in 10 days, gets intense again at 14 and to 81 days, and tends to normalize after some time, but never gets back to normal. So now we have a population of classical monocytes in the blood that do not have CCR2 or have a very low expression of CCR2. I was very curious to see if this population was just a fluke, just because we have a downregulation of the receptor from the membrane, or if it was really a new phenotype with a new kind of function. So what I did was, first of all, count those cells in terms of absolute numbers. And this is like the paper that we published with Asper Kalas right here. Uh, which is like the expansion of this population during the acute phase of SIV and HIV infection. And I'm going to talk about that they are functionally similar to myeloid-derived suppressor cells, but that's for the end of the talk. So what I did was count the absolute number of those cells, and it was very clear to me that the way that those cells uh, behave longitudinally was different from the classical monocytes. The classical monocytes kind of disappear from the blood at day four, day seven, which makes sense as if they are really migrating to inflammatory sites like spleen, lung, brain. While this goes down, the population of CCR2 negative cells, they start going up and peak at 14 days. And it's amazing that people talk a lot about the increase of monocyte numbers during SIV, HIV infection. And I think that a part of this increase is because of this population here that keeps going on while the infection goes on. In fact, as you can see in terms of ratio, here's the ratio of CCR2 positive and CCR2 negative. Here's the normal. At seven days, it goes down very intensely. and never goes back to normal afterwards. Well, those cells, I decided to, uh, to sort those cells. So here are the classical monocytes sorted between CCR2 very negative and CCR2 positive. And the markers were also in part different from one population to the other. The CCR2 negative cells, they express less HLA-DR, they express less CD4, they express um, almost the same as CD11B, the same as angiotensin receptor, which is, I'm, we're gonna know why I'm talking about that later, less CCR5, less TNF-alpha, uh, the same as CD56, uh, and I know that for you guys, CD56 is NK cells, but for the monkeys, it is monocytes. They don't mark the NK cells, but just monocytes. And then what I decided to do is to take those cells and then analyze the transcriptome of those cells. And here are the results using nanostring, which is a new technology that uses um, probes with a string of dyes for each one of the genes. We were able to quantitate those markers, and here for cytokines, chemokines, type 1 interferon, so like receptors, chemokine receptors, and transcription-related genes. And you can see that here, on, always on the right, is for CCR2 positive cells, and on the left, CCR2 negative cells. And you will see that a lot of the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines is downregulated in our population, upregulated in the CCR2 positive cells. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot, a lot of time here in this uh, slide, but I wanna show you something very interesting that I wanna discuss later, is that we noticed that two genes, NOS2 
and STAT3 was upregulated in the CCR2 negative cells. And that triggered our imagination to see why we would have NOS2 in this population cell of cells. And I had read a lot of papers about suppressive cells, and they express NOS2. So I thought, oh, maybe those cells are suppressive. Instead of just like, a, 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 I remember when I had like meetings here with Khalil, we used to call those cells the lazy cells, because they apparently they had nothing. You know, almost like uh, cells that had no function. But because of this NOS2, we kept thinking, well, maybe there is a no, a, something more to those cells than just uh, a change of phenotype. So, I said that it's very dark, but uh, we analyzed other functions of those cells using, in this case, phagocytosis, which we use a bacteria covered with a dye, a fluorescent dye called Frodo, and uh, we give that to the monocytes and see how long it takes like, to you know, phagocyte those cells. And we noticed that our cells, they phagocyte much fewer particles of Frodo, and, we, and, uh, and fewer cells uh, phagocyte, and they phagocyte fewer particles. And when you see which cells really phagocyte in terms of monocytes, the, here you can see the cells that phagocyte and see that don't phagocyte. You can see that all the cells that do not phagocyte that are classical monocytes, they are CCR2 negative. And the CCR2 positive cells, they phagocyte the Frodo. So those cells that we found, they have impaired phagocytosis. Use a transwell system in which you put the PBMCs on the top, and then you put cells there, not PBMCs, and then you put CCL2 in the bottom, and you analyze the trafficking of those cells through a little membrane. We notice also that those cells have impaired chemotaxis. Here, so the uninfected, we see like this beautiful population of CCR2 positive, these 14 positive cells, and almost no cells in the 14 day infected animals. Those cells present fewer copies of SIV genomic DNA. We isolated uh, DNA from all those populations, the classicals, the intermediate, the non-classicals, and the classical CCR2 positive, CCR2 negative. And we see that they have fewer copies of the DNA. Here, ACC was a name that we gave to those cells a long time ago, and the reviewers don't like it. But we decided to keep here. We'd be like atypical CCR2 negative classicals. Um, so here's the, the CCR2 negative cells, CCR2 positive cells. Here the intermediate, and here the non-classical monocytes. Uh, here I would like just to uh, ask you to pay a little bit of, uh, more of, of attention here, because people publish saying that the intermediate uh, monocytes are the ones most infectable by uh, SIV, or HIV, both in fact. But what I see is if you split the population of classicals in, in, uh, between CCR2 and CCR2 negative, you can see that maybe what is happening is just like biased. Maybe you have so many cells that are CCR2 negative and they are not infectable that you, you think that the classicals are not completely infected by SIV. Maybe if you just separate them in a HIV as well, you're gonna see this difference. A very interesting thing is that when you treat the animals with heart, that population disappears. Not just disappears, but the other population, you know, the CCR2 positive cells, they go back to normal. And our population here is the untreated in red, and here the blue, uh, the treated monkeys. So heart reverts the subset to a normal state again, at least in, uh, during acute infection. Those animals are treated at 12 days. And uh, you can see here the ratio that you saw that kept like constant uh, during like infection. Once you treat right here, the, it tends to go back to normal again. And uh, so all of this I did in monkeys, all of this I did at Hopkins. And when I was discussing with Esper to do my thesis here, we decided to compare those findings with humans here in Brazil. So I took a cohort of patients from Esper, and those patients, they were like newly infected, like in maybe months of infection, and then some months after this baseline, and a year or more after the baseline. And here we have the same kind of panel, CD14 positive, CD16 in an uninfected human and here in an infected human. You see an increase of the uh, non-classical monocytes and intermediate monocytes, which is something that we see also in the monkeys. But very interestingly, when you put the classical monocytes to analyze for CCR2 and CCR5, we see, we see like this population of both negative for CCR2 and CCR5 in the humans, and it tends like to get better with infection. So here's visit one, visit two, visit four, or visit, visit six, depending on the, the patient. 
Here, this patient is not very dramatically. This, you can see negative and then getting better. Or at times, just staying negative for the whole uh, infection, at least like for one year or more. And there was a very interesting patient that, sorry, this one here, which had a large proportion of CCR2 negative, CCR5 negative classical monocytes, and they di he didn't get better. In fact, he got worse. And when I went back to aspirin and asked what happened to this patient, was he treated? Well, he died like two months after this visit. So I, we're not sure if this is a prognostic, you know, like for bad, you know, a bad prognostic or if it was just like a, a parallel finding. When we compared controls with infected baseline and then three months later, six months later or a year, uh, we see that there is an increase of a percentage of CCR2 uh, negative monocytes among the classical monocytes. Uh, so here you have two things that have to take into consideration. The first thing is, in monkeys I was using fresh blood, which makes m so much easier to detect uh, CCR2, CCR5. I'm pretty sure that you know here maybe we we'll change those results, even get more of these cells if we had um, fresh blood. When you thaw the cells, you always lose a little bit of the receptors. Another thing that uh, is very interesting is they have like those two people here. I know that in the United States we have HIPAA, means that we cannot talk about the patients. Here in Brazil we have HIPAA, kind of more or less. Yeah? But those controls here, there are people from our lab. So, uh, first of all, I don't believe those cells are just in HIV infected people. I'm pretty sure that all the inflammatory diseases are going to have those cells. I've been working with dengue and hepatitis C. I didn't find in dengue, but I found a hepatitis C, this population. So I don't think that it's just related to HIV. But uh, the reviewers kept saying, why do you have those two people there that have a lot of those cells? I have no idea. You know? You know, I don't know if I can go back to the controls in the lab and just ask them to do an HIV test, because you know, maybe they are HIV positive, I have no idea. But I think, I'm pretty sure that they are not. But I think that may have some kind of other symptoms, some other inflammation that might be you know, triggering the, the expansion of this population. Interestingly, when you treat those patients, we can see that there is also a decrease of the percentage of CCR2 negative cells from the untreated to treated, which is also very significant and follows what happens in monkeys. And then just to end this uh, part of the presentation was maybe the most important experiment for me, which was for the first time I really felt, wow, I found something really important. Because up to that point, those cells were not doing anything important. You know, they, well, they don't phagocytose, they don't go anywhere. As I said, they were lazy cells. But then I decided to do an experiment in which I took PBMCs from uninfected monkeys, uh, eliminate all the monocytes from those PBMCs, and cultivate those cells with nothing or with mo monocytes coming from uninfected animals or coming from infected animals that had a larger amount of CCR2 negative cells. So here are the CCR2 negative cells, the CCR2 positive cells. I incubate those PBMCs with PHA and L2, and I measure proliferation for five days. And what we saw was very intriguing. Uh, so intriguing that I, where's the data? Oh, here. So in vitro, what we saw is, we saw a decrease of proliferation of uh, CD8 cells, but not CD4 cells, which was very, uh, interesting. We thought that we both populations, but we saw a most pronounced uh, um, suppression of proliferation in the CD8 positive cells, and in, we also saw a very uh, a great decrease of production of interferon gamma, which may be related to the small amount of proliferation of CD8 cells. We're not sure about that, but. Another very important finding was that when we compared the percentage of CD8 positive cells for CD69, which is a marker for activation, and the uh, percentage of CD14 classical cells that were CCR2 negative, they form a very nice, uh, modest, but nice and significant co negative correlation, meaning that the more cells you have of monocytes that have this phenotype, fewer cells CD68 positive marked with CD69. And uh, we analyzed also, sorry, in the order here, other chemokines that in our system, in our monkey system, and we found out that there was a slight correlation between the amount of CCL2 and CXCO4 in the, 
in the population of monkeys that are infected with SIV and had those uh, CCR2 negative cells. When you try to do an in vitro experiment for that, we notice that CXL4 causes a down regulation of CCR2 in classical monocytes, very similar to LPS. From this finding here, we suggest, we hypothesize that when a monkey or a human being is infected by SIV and HIV, in the first 20 days, you have what you call the cytokinic storm, which is like release a large amount of cytokines, inflammatory cytokines in the blood, in the tissues. It, this is very well documented. We see that in the monkeys as well. We believe that this change of cytokines in environments such as spleen or lymphoid or other lymphoid organs leads to a change of phenotype from R2 positive to R2 negative, uh, classical monocytes, which is gonna lead to a decrease of inflammation because now we don't have like a high proliferation of CD8s. Uh, decrease of trafficking, which might be important so that we don't have a lot of cells going to the brain, going to the spleen and spreading that virus. And therefore, an increase of, uh, decrease of reservoirs, and of course, it would be like an increase of survival. But in the negative side, we have a like, decrease of proliferation of CD8s, which is very important, the very crucial moment of the infection. And on decrease of phagocytosis, leading to, ma to maybe like an exposure to other uh, parasites. And, uh, but this was just a hypothesis. So is that important negative? or positively, we don't know yet, but I have some clues about that. So the conclusion that I have now is that during HIV and SIV infection, monocytes act as target cells for infection. And here I have a like, new perspective, which is the title of my, my talk. So the new perspective is that we have the identification of a suppressor subset in HIV and SIV infection. We already saw uh, suppressor monocytes. I was talking to people today during lunchtime, and they ha already have seen, have seen that in cancer and leishmania and other diseases, but not in SIV and HIV. Uh, we don't know if it's a positive or a negative factor. Uh, positive because maybe decreased activation and inflammation, or negative because it's going to suppress immunological responses. And uh, in this case here, I have a little piece of data that I cannot share with you completely. But what we did was we treated monkeys with anti-inflammatory drugs, and then we infected those monkeys with SIV. And we noticed that once you treat with those anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, that population shows up. The CCR2 negative population shows up. Those monks that were treated with that drug and then infected, they had larger viral load, especially in the CNS, and we had to sacrifice those monkeys much earlier than the normal. So apparently, having that population before infection can be a very bad thing. Uh, now, this is not the paper, this is new data. Uh, where are those cells coming from? The reviewers kept saying, well, maybe those cells are just coming, uh, immature cells coming from the bone marrow. What we did was we treated some monkeys with BRDU, and then uh, two, from 12 hours to 24 hours after that, we sacrificed the monkeys, and we measured amount of BRDU positive cells in the tissues, in the blood. And what we saw was that class, I'm gonna be always talking about classical monocytes here, okay? So classical monocytes, at 12 hours, you don't see a lot of them in the blood. In fact, you see almost like no monocytes in the blood after 12 hours in this system. But at 20 hours, we can see a small amount of CCR2 positive cells coming out of the bone marrow and staying in the blood, but not CCR2 negative cells. But the most interesting thing part of this is that when you took this animal here that presented positive BRDU cells in the blood and analyze the spleen, bone marrow, and lung, what we saw is in the bone marrow it had no cells at all, as if those monocytes are already released in the blood, the ones that were marked with BRDU. By the way, all those monocytes are KI67 negative, so they are not proliferating. But in the spleen, we have a large amount of CCR2 positive cells, almost tending in traffic or, or migrating towards this quadrant, which is exactly the CCR2 negative uh, quadrant, which we don't see in the lung. I believe that those cells here are becoming macrophages already, and maybe the spleen, they are still in monocytes, or maybe becoming macrophages, but CCR2 positive tending to CCR2 negative. Those are two, uh, only two monkeys. Uh, we are waiting for new monkeys now to be sacrificed so that we can do more experiments, but that's going to be our new uh, project. So I'm going to make just a little quick intermission here. I will ask in Portuguese some questions here. 
uh, because now this is the data that I have from my lab. But while I was studying this, I read a lot of other stuff that I think would be very interesting for you guys to know about. But I'm going to ask one question. Um, the first case of AIDS started in 1981, diagnosed in 1981. Quem aqui nasceu por volta de 1981? Levanta a mão. Quem aqui tinha cinco anos até dez anos, em 1981? Até dez anos. Pois é. A Renata, a Daniela, você tinha 20 anos em 81. Bom, gente, quem aqui conhece uma pessoa íntima que já morreu de HIV? É muito raro... A gente vê agora as pessoas morrendo de HIV. É muito raro, de, de, de AIDS. A minha geração, o Esper vê isso, a Daniela vê isso. A gente, eu pedi oito amigos em um ano. É uma, foi uma coisa espantosa, uma coisa muito assustadora. A AIDS realmente teve um impacto muito grande na, na população. Mas um grande impacto da AIDS também foi na área da ciência. Uh, now, agora eu posso já conversar em inglês. Uh, in science, what happened was, before AIDS, microbiology was almost like a dead field. You know, people are not doing microbiology anymore. In fact, the course for microbiology in USP, where I was, did my master's degree, we had like inscription, inscriptions after, after, you know, every two years for you to have master's. I mean, you have to apply for a master's degree there every two years. And I remember as soon as I graduated, I found a job very fast because we didn't have microbiologists. With AIDS, this changed a lot. Immunology, microbiology changed a lot because of HIV. And one thing that was very interesting is that I was trying to prove that, to show you guys. And what I did was I counted the absolute number of papers with the word virus. And then I put just in PubMed, there is a little program that you can do that to see how many papers are published. So here is... Uh, the absolute number of papers with the word virus in PubMed per year. It's just absolute number. And you can see that we have like two curves here. We have one curve that goes up to 1980 something, and then a steep curve that goes up. It doesn't look very dramatic, does it? But now when you see that per 100,000 papers, that's what you see. So up to 1980, uh, let me see, uh, right here, we don't start going up, 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 and then 1980, which is right there, we have, can you see that between 70 and 80, we almost had like a plateau, almost nobody was publishing anymore about virus, apparently, in terms of percentage, and suddenly AIDS comes and gives like a boost and goes up again, but I was very surprised that after you know, in the 90s, it starts going back down again, and when I measure exactly which year it was, was in 1996, which is exactly when heart started. So it's funny that now that heart started, people is like publishing less in terms of virus and more about other stuff. But anyway, it's changed a lot in terms of science. And what I'm show, gonna show you here is some things that are not related to AIDS, possibly will be related to AIDS in the future. So new perspectives about monocytes and other myeloid cells. The first one, which I love this paper, is a paper that was published two years ago, three years ago, 2009, uh, by, uh, by Swirsky. And he identified a reservoir of monocytes in the spleen, not macrophages, monocytes. So we always thought the monocytes would come out of the bone marrow, go to the blood, and go to the tissue and become macrophages. This guy here published in mouse model, showing that the monocytes stay inside the spleen, stay there for several days, until they are necessary. In this case, it's a model for infarction. So do you remember I told you about the uh, angiotensin receptor that my monocytes express the same way both? Well, they, when they give angiotensin receptor to those mice, the monocyte just comes out of the spleen and goes to the heart. And here's a little bit, a little movie that I was not able to embed it in my slides, but you can see the monocyte here in the tissue. And then after some moments, he's moving, falls in the blood, and boom, start walking in the blood. Uh, not macrophages, but monocytes, with monocyte markers, which is very hard for us uh, to do that in humans and monkeys. I haven't found that any other paper after this. I'm st still waiting for someone to publish in other species. 
but if you go to Wikipedia, for instance, and read about monocytes, they say, oh, and they are a, a reservoir in the spleen. They're already like, it's considered there is a reservoir in the spleen. So monocytes, they're not just coming from the bone marrow. Maybe they are going to stay in the spleen for some time. And it's very hard for us who work with monkeys to know if this happens or not, because when you sacrifice the monkeys, the spleen, uh, during the necropsy, they squeezes and releases a lot of blood. So maybe we're losing that population because of the necropsy. But wait for news about that. You know, I'm pretty sure that people are going to talk more about other, the reservoir of other cells in spleen. Spleen is not just like, uh, of course, that mouse the spleen is a little bit different. Um, the size of a monocyte in the mouse is the same size as ours. They just have like fewer cells. So uh, maybe they need another storage area, you know, like for the monocytes. But maybe we have that in humans as well or even in other animals. And then another new perspective is that, as I told you, once I saw that those cells were expressing NOS2, I started reading more about suppressive monocytes. And I was very surprised to see how many papers were published about suppressive monocytes, but not in infectious disease. It was all in cancer. So we have like this, this group here that was studying CD14 uh, positive, HLA-DR negative cells or monocytes in lymphoma. Uh, this one in prostate cancer. And uh, I think this one was not in cancer, but then they start finding those uh, blood monocytes that can suppress the cell function and cause out, uh, immunity, but nothing in infectious disease. Um, so then I noticed that a lot of people published this population of monocytes, but instead of calling, him, calling them monocytes, they are calling them myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So you can see here, CD14 positive cell, uh, HLA-DR negative, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Uh, not that I doubt that those cells exist. I appreciate that they exist, but I don't think that they have a very nice system of marking of those cells now. So uh, I was very interested in that when I was reading more about, this paper, about this, these cells, this guy is the guy that is like the king of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and he published this review, what's considered one of the best reviews in nature in the last 10 years. So apparently those cells really exist. It's just that uh, they do not have a, a wonderful markers to separate them from the other cells. So for you guys that do not, never heard about those cells, what happened is a long time ago in mouse models, they found out that around the tumors, they would have a lot of cells with a suppressed phenotype. The first ones that they found out were the cells that look like granulocytes, but they were not granulocytes. They were kind of like immature granulocytes that express a lot of suppressive markers. And then, some years later, they found out in other cancers that some cells that do not look like granulocytes, but look like monocytes, they're also being recruited to, uh, to cancer sites with a suppressive uh, phenotype. And then we have now the two populations, the granulocytic myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and the monocytic myeloid-derived suppressor cells. The review of my paper kept saying, how do you know if those monocytes are not myeloid-derived suppressor cells? I don't. I mean, nobody knows the difference between a, a monocyte that is CD14 positive, HLA-DR negative, and a myeloid-derived suppressor cells that is monocytic. And just to prove my point, this review came out like last year, when this guy shows all those phenotypes that could be myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And even the, the reviewer writes that future studies will aim at the identification of better markers to distinguish CD14 HLA-DR positive monocytes from CD14 positive like low negative MDS cells. So those cells, I'm pretty sure they're going to be very popular soon as well. Once I publish that in HIV, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are going to start trying to find those cells in other systems. So, be aware that it's going to happen. But, interestingly, the fact that monocytes lose at the HLA-DR is not like a, an uncommon thing. We see that in sepsis. So, are my cells really monocytes that lost the HLA-DR, or are my cells these cells? They consider those cells immature cells. I do not consider my cells immature. I think that it really came from classical monocytes. But that's a question of belief. Now I have to prove that with my experiments. So now we have suppressor cells. One that you guys know are the Tregs. Everybody knows about them. 
Okay? So now I present to you the myeloid-derived suppressor cells that can be granulocytic, monocytic. Now I added monocytes that can be also suppressor. And you know that some macrophages can be suppressor. My macrophages type 2 can be suppressor. But now I introduce to you lymphocytes B that can be also suppressor. So now a group, uh, several groups have been publishing about the evidence and development origin of a population of Bregs, not Tregs. So the suppressor population of cells is growing, you know, exponentially. So we're going to have NK suppressor cells, platelet suppressor cells. Uh, and apparently it's not some kind of fluke. A lot of people believe it, and they show the, the change in behavior, the change in functionality of those cells. So we wait for the Bregs now, besides the Tregs. And now my favorite thing of all time, the last year. When I was reading about macrophages, monocytes, blah, 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 there's a group, a Japanese group, and, uh, the Kava, Kavamoto in Japan, and a group in New York, and Albert Einstein, uh, Tom Graff. What they are doing is they are changing the phenotype of B cells into macrophages. So they are able to transfect B cells, mature B cells, CD19, beautiful. They transfect with CBP, which is a transcription factor. And after the transfection, those cells become macrophages with mac macrophage function, phagocytosis and everything. Then another group published that they were able to transform T cells progenitors into macrophages, doing the same thing, CBP alpha, beta, and PU1. Once you transfect, boom, they lose the markers, the THI marker, and they gain the MAC1 marker. They become macrophages. This group, what they did was a beautiful work with mice. They took some like DN1, DN2 T cells, and they put in those in mice, and they noticed that those cells go to the thymus, and 30% of the DN1 cells become macrophages in the thymus of of young uh, mice. So now my question is, what is a macrophage? Is coming from monocytes or is able to come from other progenitor cells? And what they are suggesting now is a change in our beautiful bifurcated theory of hematopoiesis, meaning that the progenitor cell becomes myeloid or lymphoid, blah, blah, blah. What they suggest with this revised scheme for development pathways of hematopoietic cells, the myeloid-based model. And I, I felt so dumb about that when I read about it, because I'd never heard about this, that I went to other immunologists at like Hopkins, and everybody says, yeah, yeah, it's important, it's going to change the world, but everybody's afraid of saying that it's correct or not. So, so maybe in your lifetime, hematopoiesis is not going to be the same. The hypothesis now is that, the, the one that we have is that, you know, the progenitor cells become either myeloid or TB cells, or lymphoid, but the new hypothesis is that there is a progenitor cell that can become myeloid. This cell can evolve to become a myeloid erythrocyte. Or it can become a myeloid T cell, B cell, that can become always in the end myeloid, depending on the changes of cytokines that they have in the bone marrow or in other lymphoid organs. And just to kind of like prove that, it's like this beautiful paper that I never heard about the, the syndrome, the syndrome of the dendritic cell monocyte B and NK lymphoid deficiency. It's some patients that by 16, 17 years old, they lose all the B cells, all the monocytes, all the NK cells, and they start having a lot of, you know, uh, infections and end up dying. And the interesting thing is that patients have no blood monocyte in their, of, of course, in their blood, in the periphery but they have the same amount of macrophages in the lung as a normal person. Either those macrophages are really living for a long period of time, or maybe they are coming from other progenitor cells. They are not monocytes. So, new perspectives. There are at least five types of suppressor cells. I'm pretty sure that in your lifetime you're going to find some more. Macrophages can be originated from the N1 and the N2 T cells. This is already proved. And it can be a big problem here, because remember I told you about contamination with T cells when you say that SIV is infecting monocytes or not? Well, if it's coming from T cells, at times it can have a little bit of T cell rearrangement, you know, or the receptor rearrangement. So that can screw up a little bit your results. 
Macrophages uh, and other two things that I'm working in my lab, which are very interesting. Macrophages M1, if you treat with IL-4, IL-13, can differentiate onto M2. So just a little bit of change in cytokine environment, you can change one, one macrophage from one thing to the other. And a new piece of data for you that just comes from a lab, my lab, I've been treating macrophages with IL-7, and I, since I, as soon as I add IL-7, in six, less than 24 hours, those macrophages lose CD14 emanose receptor. So what kind of cells are these if they are not macrophages? So my question is, what is a macrophage, really? You know, I think that we, well, Simon Gordon, when he was writing the review about macrophages, he wrote, like, we are far from understanding exactly what a macrophage really is and how many phenotypes there are. And how plastic is our immune system? We're talking about CD4s, they are cytotoxic. We're talking about myeloid cells that can become, you know, the, or T cells that can become myeloid cells. So I think in your lifetime, even after AIDS, you're going to still see a lot of new things happening, and I think you're going to be participating in that. I would like to acknowledge, you know, my lab in Hopkins, especially Jens Clemens and Chris Inc., who are like my favorite people in the world. After Asper Callas, of course, here from the Lymph Center. And thank you so much for George and uh, Kalil and for Edesio for uh, hosting me here so well. Uh, the people in the lab that helped me to finish that data and for our financial support. Thank you. <laughs>